This is episode 38 of Off Script with Trish Glose. Intimate interviews and fun conversations with interesting people. In front of my microphone today is Larry Smith. Hello, Larry Smith. Well, hello, Trish. You are the Jacksonville town historian. Among other things. You substitute teach. Yes. You are semi-retired. Yes. Which I don't believe because I feel like you're doing a lot these days. What else is on your plate? Well, this afternoon I'm painting my bathroom. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's good. That's important. The paint's uh, 15 years old, so we, we're uh, doing a new paint job. Okay. We are going to talk a lot about Jacksonville specifically and all the other jobs you've had in your life. But first, I like to start out all my conversations with where are you from originally? Well, originally from Wilshire Boulevard. That's when my twin brother and I were born down in California. Wow. At Good Sam Hospital. And we lived in Santa Monica for five years. Dad felt he was running out of elbow room in 1945 and <laughs> took off. Of course, he went there in 1928. Wow. And so from Montana. So he was living up in the mountains of Montana where Grandpa was working for the railroad, uh, the Great Northern. And he got tired of the snow, went down there for high school, fell in love with it. He could have fresh fruit year-round. Mm -hmm. He yeah. fell in love with Southern California. Yes. And so he lived there from 28, went back to Montana, met my mother, married, came back to Southern California lived through the war with uh, working at Douglas Aircraft. Okay. That kept him out of the war, but he was producing warplanes. Well, what it, yeah, what I was going to ask what he yeah. did. Yeah, it was uh, the DC-3, he was involved in that. Wow. And the B-24 uh, and so forth. And then we moved up here in 1945 with my twin and uh, grew up in Phoenix. Okay, so you lived in Southern California for just a blink. Yeah, five years. Look okay. at the tad over five years. Okay. Um, and you have a twin. Yes, Lloyd. Lloyd. Where's yeah. Lloyd? Well, he was living in Grants Pass. He taught school over there for 25 years, and now he is up in Longview, Washington. His wife got a job up there. They moved up there after he retired. Okay. And now he burns bodies. Okay. <laughs> It, like cremation, I'm assuming? Yes, he does okay. uh, 30 to 50 tons a year. What a way to introduce <laughs> his occupation. He does how much a year? 30 to 50 tons. Interesting. How did he get into that? <laughs> his son-in-law was uh, working for Hull and Hull, and they needed somebody to come in at night to pick up bodies. And so he started working in Grants Pass, started working at nights mm -hmm. there and, uh, and teaching during the day. And then he... Uh, started uh, when he went up north he put out his resume hey i can pick up bodies and they said well we need a crematorium operator mm -hmm. so he uh, took that over okay do you know a lot about how that works it's it's one body at a time right yes it has to be has because to be. it's against the law to commingle yes and especially for a family member if i'm having someone cremated i want their ashes yes only and the hardest part uh, he finds is when the family comes in and wants to watch, and so everything has to be oh. really careful. But every, every so often they get, uh, a father will come in. This just happened two weeks ago. Father came in and pushed his own son in, oh killed in a car accident. gosh. 19 years old. So he sees some really sad situations. Oh, I bet. And then sometimes a Buddhist will come in, and they put on a lot of uh, ceremony around the crematory, while everything is burning. That's kind of nice, actually, that <laughs> thought. I'm sure it's it's probably sad, but I'm also I'm wondering if there's a huge sense of closure. It's like a, it's an end. It's a period. Yeah, it's it is. And, and people, especially w with their teenage sons or their teenage daughters, right. when they were actually there watching it, it must be terribly hard to do something like that. But uh, I just read this week there is really no true closure when it comes to losing a loved one like like that. Especially if it's a child. It's just sort of, um, it's unnatural, I've heard, when, when a parent loses a child. It's just not how nature's supposed to go. That's right. So I'm sure that's, yes, you're right. There's probably never closure. But I've gone out there to watch him work and so on. It's something Watch him burn bodies? Yeah, it's something I don't want to do. But uh, he said, in fact, he even had a, uh, a, kid, a girl come out to do her senior project on cremation. She wanted to become a funeral, funeral director. So she came out and uh, took part in the cremation. Wow. That's, that's a very interesting occupation. Yeah. When someone asks you, and his official title is what? It's not, it doesn't say burning bodies on his no. business card. <laughs> yeah, he's a funeral director. Funeral director. Okay. Yeah. And that's Lloyd. Yes. Lloyd Smith. So Lloyd and Larry growing up as, as twins, what was that like? You have a built-in good buddy. Well. Ish. <laughs> 
<laughs> at Christmas time, we got one major gift. Oh, really? Yes, because, uh, well, remember, this is the 19, early 1950s. Dad oh, was earning yeah. $2 an hour. We, we, okay, we live, all right, all right. We live comfortably, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> though there was really no place to spend it anyway. True. And then, um, so the, the ultimate gift was in 1958, the Christmas is 1958. We get handed a one box, and it says, nope, this isn't the one. Oh, okay. And then we opened up another box, and it says, this is not the one either. We went through four of those. And finally, the, li the fifth box was a key. Mm. And a funny feeling went down my backbone. What is going on? Right. And Mother got us up. Dad had disappeared. We didn't realize he had gone out from behind the tree, and he was gone. And we went outside to our backyard, and there were floodlights. Dad plugged in floodlights. He'd set up on step ladders <laughs> around a brand new 57 Chevy. Oh, my goodness. And we shared it for 100,000 miles. Look at that. And sold it for $300. They're now worth over 30000 Yeah. So you guys were really good at sharing then. You yes. had to be. Yeah, and, and we got a lot, we were identical twins, so okay. I think there was a lot of affinity there. We shared friends. Uh, we didn't share girlfriends. Okay, I was going <laughs> to ask, but didn't really want to. Okay, that's no. good. No girlfriend but, sharing. Right, but uh, finally, uh, we, when we f graduated from college, mm -hmm. after five years of college, we'd had one class separate from each other. Mm. That was a calculus class that Lloyd wanted to take over again. I had no desire to take it over again, but he took it over again. That was the only class. Okay. So uh, when, but yet we were our own individuals, but uh, what bothered me the most was to be called Twinny. Mm, or, when other or, people or, or, call Yeah, or the twin. You know, and, and they didn't have a name. They just said, oh, here comes the twin. It's like, no, my name's Larry. Yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, did you guys have weird twin things happen to you? Oh, all the time. Okay, like what? Well, well, I remember so often I'd be humming a song. Back in the days when songs had melodies, you know, they don't have melodies anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but back when they had okay. melodies, I'd have a song in my head, and I'd be singing it in my head. Uh-huh. And Lloyd would start humming it at the exact same spot. Uh-uh. Uh, no yes. way. And now here's something that's really strange. About uh, uh, four, three years ago, I went over to Ed's Tires to buy tires. Okay. Great place to buy tires. Mm -hmm. This is not an advertisement for I Ed's, know, but, but it's just a, Ed's a good guy. <laughs> yes, he is, and supports the community. And uh, I went over there, and I've, uh, they talked me into buying these tires from Finland. They are really top of the line. We were doing, going up to Crater Lake a lot. I was doing some volunteer work up there. I wanted some really good tires. Mm -hmm. And so I called my brother while we, they were putting them on, and, and we got talking, and I said, uh, I'm buying this, uh, these Finn tires. And uh, the week before, he had just bought the identical type. Uh, of all the thousands of kind, he bought the same ones. And you had no clue? No. I think they're called Nico or something like that. And then uh, we were doing snowshoe hikes at Critter Lake. We right. show up. We were wearing exactly the same boots, absolutely identical. <laughs> and he came down from Washington. I came up from Jacksonville. And mine wore out last year, and I just noticed he put a post up. His wore out this year. <laughs> That's crazy. And it can go on and on and That's on. That's so like awesome, that. though. I mean, it's just there is something about <laughs> being a twin. I mean, oh, I definitely shared, believe it, yes. You shared, you're from, a, I mean, you're split. It's just, it was this one little, mm -hmm. I don't want to get too scientific, but you shared this space for whatever, eight, nine months. We were womb mates. Womb mates, exactly. <laughs> I love it. Well, that's awesome. Um, and so Lloyd's doing good. He's. Yes, he is. Okay. And uh, he's three years I mean, three minutes younger. Three I minutes have younger. The, I have the birthright. Okay, good. You're the oldest. And that actually makes sense, just knowing you just a, a, a tidbit, that you would be the oldest. Did uh, Any other siblings or just you two? Dad said he proved he was a man. <laughs> <laughs> he always used that line. <laughs> awesome. With just the two of you. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people, I have, um, my nephews are twins. They're oh. fraternal twins. And mm. my brother and his wife basically said, two for one, we're done. Good night. That's it. <laughs> two for one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're done. We're, we're good to go. So growing up in Southern Oregon. Yes. You moved yeah. to Phoenix at like five, you said. Yes. Uh -huh. What was that like growing up? And what, what year are we talking here? This was? 1945. 45. So what was it like growing up in Southern well, Oregon then? 
we were just coming out of a war economy. Mm -hmm. And my mother's relatives had been in North Dakota. That's where my grandparents landed coming from the old country and then ended up in Southern California. And they just happened to get there just before the war started. So they all had jobs. Okay. And they did really well down there. And then in 1945, they wanted to get back into farming. And they were tired of Southern California also. And so my dad started hearing about this big migration of the Paulsons and the Seversons and the Rasmussens mm -hmm. coming up here to Southern Oregon. And dad came up here, and this was in Eden. And so he found a place in South Pacific Highway, and the rest of the family, a lot of them went over to Fern Valley mm -hmm. and settled in little farms over there. And by about 1955, we had over 100 relatives within a 10-mile radius of Phoenix. Wow. And these were all first, second, third cousins of my mom, mostly. Wow. A huge family. Yeah. This was a huge family. So uh, we grew up with a l around a lot of relatives mm -hmm. on my mother's side. Dad's side, no. They were all down in Southern California still. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that was really nice. Uh, in fact, this last week, mother's last cousin passed away at 95 years of age. So that era now is gone, and mm -hmm. uh, now we're down into our generation. But uh, s uh, most of the people went to Phoenix. We were farmer kids. Okay. And these were small farms. The, the, all the farmers had, most, for the most part, had to work. Dad worked at Tucker Snowcat. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and that's another whole story in itself. I, yeah, I bet. And then, uh, so, and, and there were mill workers and so on. So it was blue collar. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of environment we grew up in. And it was the Eisenhower era. You know, everything was perfect. Right, exactly. In Southern Oregon. Right. <laughs> Not necessarily elsewhere. Right. Because I ended up later on, I just did an a hour and a half program for a bunch of kids over at Roosevelt School on our, my wife's family who were slave owners back uh, 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I bring that all the way up through segregation when Lloyd and I lived in Texas under segregation in 19... Or, yeah, 1961 to 63, and what it was like for farm kids to be living under segregation and in uh, East Texas. And then uh, I bring it up to Martin Luther King. It's quite a story. I bet it is. Uh, and the kids just sat there for an hour and a half and listened to that. So I tied all this together in showing how Martin Luther King. You know, a lot of the kids don't realize, we talk about Martin Luther King. Well, he was a great man. Well, what did he do? Well, he freed the slaves. No, that was Abraham Lincoln. Come on now, kids. And, but I bring this up from slavery through our family up to when living under segregation up to what Martin Luther King did. Mm -hmm. And where I was at the moment that I learned that he had was inaugurated, it was a powerful story. Mm -hmm. And uh, for sixth graders to sit for an hour and a half and the questions just poured out of the kids. Oh, that's awesome. So anyway, I... Well, he's a, he's a huge, huge part of our history. Yeah, but people, the kids don't really connect. Exactly. And I, when I started the program, I said, now, you've got to watch out. I said, I'm going to be telling you some really ugly stuff about America. I said, this stuff happened in America. It didn't happen up in Oregon. It happened down south. But, and I got into the slavery, and I showed a little, just very briefly, what slavery, slavery was like, touched on it. Uh, that, uh, and the kids said, you mean you could own a human being? I said, yeah, you can own somebody. They had a bill of sale for them. Mm -hmm. And the kids were shocked. These are 11 and 12-year-olds, and they didn't even know that. Hmm. So That's anyway, amazing. It was, a, it was a great program, and I felt like I touched the kids. But don't you think, too, like, yes, that didn't happen on the West Coast necessarily, but America's history, is it's all of our history. Mm -hmm. All of the mistakes oh, yeah. that we've made, we've all made them together. And ne not necessarily, you know, you said your mother's family owned slaves, that has nothing to do my, with my you. wife's family. Oh, your wife's family. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, that has nothing to do with you or me. That was that was then, and we learn from our mistakes yeah. and we move on. Well, and the and the redeeming part was his son Nicholas, my wife's great great grandfather, okay. became a minister. He went off to ministerial school there in Alabama. He comes back, and he says, "Dad, this is wrong. Hmm. Slavery is wrong," mm -hmm. and he got thrown off the plantation. If he hadn't been thrown off the plantation, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you because my wife wouldn't have been born. Exactly. <laughs> so he moved to East Texas and uh, set, set, settled in there preaching against slavery and uh, running a family of five kids. And so then his wife dies. And he, it's Good quite, for him. It's a long story, but it's a, it's a wonderful story. I bet. It sounds like an amazing story. But yeah. that's the redemption in it. Yeah. And then here, if I can get this in. This Please is, get this, it in. This yes. This is really Let's neat. do it. 
be, he moved out of East Texas when it became a slave. When Texas became a slave state, he had to move. He was forced to move, so he okay. moved to Central Texas because he was against slavery. Right. Okay. And it, then Texas became a slave state. Right. And, and balanced with Oregon. Oregon came in as a free state. Texas came in as a slave state. You know how they did that compromise. Right, right. And when he got to Central uh, Texas, uh, he, he died at 51. He eventually had 54 great grand or 54 grandchildren. Anyway, goodness, he died. They buried him on the family farm, mm -hmm. and the neighbors would come over and destroy his tombstone. This happened repeatedly because they knew he was against slavery and wow. they were pro-slavery. This was in 19, 1869, right after the Civil War. Uh -huh. Well, guess who ended up buying his land? The U.S. Army. Fort Hood sits on the Henderson property, and now it is guarded by the U.S. Army. And wow. it sits right in the heart of his grave is right in the heart of Fort Hood. And so when I got to that point in the story and I told the kids, I do it at kind of a spot, I said, they kept destroying his graves. I said, and guess who's guarding it now? And a picture of Fort Hood comes up. I said, the U.S. Army is guarding. And then I show a picture of Henderson's grave. And uh, so it's, it's quite a story of how. It is a good story. We're really learning our history today with you, which I knew was going to happen. I knew that was going to happen. Well, you were talking about Civil War and the anti-slavery racism and stuff like that, even here in Southern Oregon. If you look at our old city hall, there's a name Davis is on it. Mm -hmm. it, it, it. That was the former owner of that property. Guy was by the name of Davis. What city hall? Uh, uh, in Jacksonville. Jacksonville City Hall. Okay. In the old city hall. Okay. But Davis was the nephew of Jefferson Davis, who was president of the Confederacy. Wow. So you see, we had Confederate people right here in Jacksonville, too. Hmm. It's just rich, just yes. rich with, with history. So you go to college where? Well, I start, started out at Southern Oregon. Okay. And we took uh, pre-engineering. Okay. And my father always said, you know, we're, we're not, um, I'm not pushing you in anything. But he wanted to become an engineer, but it was child of depression. There was no way he could, mm -hmm. he could go to school. He ended up uh, becoming a machinist and a top-notch machinist, basically self-taught. But he said, let's just get started on something. How about pre-engineering? Okay. So we took trigonometry in high school and, and uh, calculus in college and so on. Blech. <laughs> Sorry. But then he found this wonderful school down in Texas, Laterno. It's a Christian engineering school. Okay. Right now, it's the top Christian engineering school in the whole nation. Mm. It's really uh, gone up. So he shipped his two boys off to Texas. <laughs> and we were down there for three years. What a great experience it was. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it was during, t uh, the school was not segregated by any means. It was an international school. But you step off campus and you mm -hmm. got into the true segregated South. And Where there was, I mean, there was bathrooms for oh, white yeah, people. Definitely. There was bathrooms for black people. Separate entrances into the, uh, the in, into uh, public buildings. There were separate entrances into theaters and so forth. Being from Oregon, was that weird for you? Extremely weird. But, you know, you didn't feel, it was just, I guess when you get down there, that was the culture. That's just how it was. It's just how it was, right. and you didn't give it much thought. But we got right on to back into campus, and it was a yeah. <laughs> uh, 200 acres of, of wonderful freedom there. Hmm. And uh, going around talking to people and so on, it, you know, you just didn't feel like you wanted to stir up too much trouble. And... Uh, you felt bad about it, but, you know, again, 18, 19 years old, what can you do about it? Yeah. And so, uh, so we went three years there, and in my final year, I got thinking, you know, there's something not, I don't think I want to really get into engineering. <laughs> <laughs> this is not for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Lloyd was having the same thoughts. Of course, because you're twins. <laughs> I know, and <laughs> what happened was, we didn't even talk about it. And uh, I ended up at the University of Nebraska after graduation. I went through Peace Corps training there. Okay. Well, the boy, did that open up the world even more so. I into bet. Things. But I didn't speak Spanish well enough at the end of, you had to, in the end of three months, you had to be verbal, and I was not. Okay. And seven of us, they bid us farewell. <laughs> and so I got on a plane, defeated, came back to Oregon. You know, you always think, no, this is, this is horrible. But it was the best thing could have happened because... That's not what you were supposed to do. I know it. See, I was off pushing my own way, but it opened up the world to me. Right. And that three months of training, uh, 12 hours to 15 hours a day at the university was wonderful. Get back to Oregon and I meet my wife. Mm. And uh, I had just met her briefly before I left, but came back. I thought, what am I going to do? 
ah, oh, I'm going to become a teacher. I thought, because I'd met some teachers that were there, and that opened up a different world to me. So I get home, had made the decision, talked to my twin brother. Guess what? He'd been down there three days earlier and had signed up for teaching. Of course. <laughs> and we, oh hadn't even, we hadn't even talked about it. That's so funny, <laughs> of course. So how did you meet your wife then? In church. Okay. Uh, I was singing in the choir. I, didn't, I don't sing. I fill a seat. And they needed a spot to, to somebody <laughs> to fill a seat. And it was something the teenagers did in those days. We sang in the church choir. It was I sang in the church choir. Yeah, the it was some of the best days ever. Yeah, the Assemblies of God Church over in uh, Ashland. It's where the fire department sits today. Okay. It sits right on top of where the church was. Oh, wow. In fact, there were two churches, right side by side, the congregation on the left, the assembly on the right, and now the fire department sits on top of both of those. Okay. Very historic buildings. Good and, vibes for yeah. the fire department. <laughs> they tore them down. <laughs> and so uh, she, her, her parents were missionaries. They just retired. They had come into church just to visit and thinking about moving over to Ashland. Uh, they were living in Grants Pass. And so I see her walk in and her eyes, just the eyes. They, I couldn't get over the eyes. What about her eyes? They just, there's just something about, it's called the red eyes. It's, it's a fa family tra uh, trait that comes through her family. And I fell in over the eyes first. Ugh. And then she was wearing a lei around her neck. Oh, okay. A bunch of dead flowers. <laughs> <laughs> they'd been th so they'd been missionaries to Hawaii, and so they'd okay. been to a banquet that gave out lays. Well, Sunday morning you we were we were lays to church. Uh, and I thought, what's she doing? With all? I, I didn't understand the Hawaiian lay cult. sounds so much better than a bunch of dead flowers. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and she ended up. Uh, so I'm sitting up in the choir, looking at her, and then I had to give a speech about leaving. And uh, so the pastor, had, we prepared this, brought me up. I was going to be gone for two years. You know, they get, the church gave, gave me a big send-off. And three months later, I show up. Well, it turns out she'd moved to Ashland and was coming to church there. And so we just picked it up from there. And then the rest is history. Yeah, and that, uh, that, f that night after I gave my little talk and so on, and uh, 20 of us, the youth people, just uh, we, went out, we wanted to show around Ashland and mm -hmm. so on. And... Uh, and uh, you went to Little Sweden, which was a little restaurant there, and get something to eat or drink. And then we walked down to Shakespeare, and Shakespeare ha didn't have that big globe over the top of it. Mm -hmm. You could stand up on the street. And so we just kind of, the rest of the 19 people were up toward the front, and Lynn and I just kind of went toward the back, and pretty soon we were just talking away mm -hmm. and getting acquainted. And um, there's a lamp post right there by the duck pond, and that's where we stopped, and the group kind of went on, and then we really got acquainted right there. That's fantastic. And so I can go back to the same light post and with Linda. Every time we're in Ashland, I go there and, okay, this is where it all started happening. Oh, Larry, <laughs> I love that story. That's so sweet. And there's something about when you meet that person and you just, you talk and you talk and you talk and just. It just happened. Minutes turn into hours and mm -hmm. you're just like, this, I think, is my person. Mm -hmm. And their folks had moved over in Clay Street. And so, uh. After classes, I'd go down to the house, hang out down there. Mama would feed me dinner. Oh. Because we lived in Phoenix, and to keep from having to drive a round trip. For sure. Because we had to go back to study at night. And so uh, we'd go up to the college, and I'd hang out until about 10 o'clock at night. And then... I love it. And you guys have been married how long? 52 years. Fantastic. Congratulations. All right, Linda, Thank that's, you. that's cheers to you. Um, so you decide to be a teacher. Yes. So after, and you're, you're going to school to do this. Yeah, I went another two and a half years. Okay, and then where did you get your first teaching job? I was substituting over at, I mean, uh, doing student teaching over at Roosevelt School. Okay. And that's where they assigned me, and I was teaching math. In fact, I told this story on Monday to a group of kids. I <laughs> took them into the exact spot, and I said, I sat them down in the library, and I said, now, not very often, can you go back to a place that changed your life? Aww. And so these little uh, 11, 12 year olds are sitting there on the floor in the library. I said, no, it's, it's this big room here, but there used to be a wall right here, right where I'm standing, there used to be a wall right here. And I was turned and faced that direction and I was teaching math for Mr. Tegner, <laughs> sixth grade. I said, you're sixth graders. I was teaching a sixth grade class. And I looked up, and in the back door, I said, there's no door there now, but in that corner there was a door. I said, and the principal from Jacksonville School walked in. 
at Francis Guidry. Uh, you know, he just, I knew why he was there. I didn't know he was coming. And he sat down, listened to me for 20 minutes, and then... Oh, he, he looked at you and said, come with me. Yeah, come with me. Ooh. And I turned to Mr. Tegner, who luckily was still in the room, and I said, uh, my master teacher, and I said, uh, Jim, I, I have to leave. Yeah, the principal <laughs> wants to talk to me. I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I walked out, and uh, he took me into the library and uh, sat me down, gave me a 20-minute interview. Mm -hmm. And he said, thank you, and you can go back to class now. And I came back, and then uh, three days later, I get this phone call. Hi, this is some from the central office. I'm not supposed to be doing this, but I'm right here typing a letter for you, and it says, congratulations, we are, goodbye. She nice. hung up. Nice. I knew I had a job. You had I didn't a job. Know, I didn't know where. Right, but you no, had a job. And then the letter came, and it said, you're assigned to Jacksonville School, fifth, fifth grade. And I stayed there for 33 years. I was just going to ask, 33 years. Yeah. So where did park, uh, park Ranger, well, where when did I, that come Well, when in? I was in college, okay. uh, my brother and I started working for the Park Service. Okay. And uh, that turned into a 20-year career for Lloyd and a 23-year career for me. So you did that alongside there's teaching? Th yeah, there are three reasons for teaching. Okay. J June, July, and August. <laughs> Perfect. So you were you worked for the Park Service in the, the summers. The day that school was out, mm -hmm. the very day, Linda and I, Linda would have everything packed, and uh, we would load up and head for the park. And then on Labor Day, Linda spent Labor Day. I spent the day working at the park, and on Labor Day she'd spend the day packing. Then I'd we'd, I'd rush home at five o'clock, load everything into the car or whatever we're driving and head back to Jacksonville, I'd be back in the classroom the next morning. No break for you. No, we did this year after year. Wow. For good. a couple of decades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what park? Well, Crater Lake. Okay. I did a little bit of work over at Oregon Caves, that uh, oh, most, mostly Crater Lake National Park. Those two places, and I get they're just really the two national parks we have here, but those two places are magical. Yes, they are. Absolutely magical. There's something about both of them. When you step onto those grounds, there's just something about both of those places. And I still get that thrill mm -hmm. every time I go up there. Nice. So what is it about history and teaching that just really floats your boat? It got, I got turned on in high school. Mr. Uh, Consbrook was the American history teacher. And... He, he, you know, he was a coach, and he was more interested in coaching than he was in teaching history. What I found out was history changes people's lives. There are events that happened. If this event hadn't happened, what would we be like? What, what would have happened afterwards? Mm. And that started intriguing me. And so when I taught history to my kids, I, t I did it from the big events, Okay, what if Napoleon had not been in that bathtub when the American ambassador came in and gave him an offer of $16 million to buy the Louisiana Purchase, which is a true story. He, he actually appeared in it. And, and so I, I build a story of, 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 of a visual image. Yeah. And if that hadn't happened right at that moment, we wouldn't have 17 states. Right. He was in the bathtub? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's so awkward. Yeah, I know it. But that's where he made the <laughs> deal. Oh, and comfy. Well, he spent a lot of time there, I guess. <laughs> he spent a lot of time in the bathroom. It was, it was a buff, but it was a bubble bath. <laughs> <laughs> of I, I'm course. Assuming, I'm assuming, the picture that uh, is of this shows a bubble bath. Well, if it's not a bubble bath, you're just an animal. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, I, 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 I take all these little things, and that's what I would, I said, can you imagine what would have happened if? And so that's why I tried mm. to teach history. And I, I get the feeling, and we're going to talk about Jacksonville in a hot second. You are a sucker for this happened right here, a hundred years ago. Like you're very much that that time and place, you know, the lamppost in Ashland with you mm -hmm. and your wife. And there are certain buildings in Jacksonville that you and I have talked about where you're like right here in 18 whatever, this happened right here where we're standing. Like that's just sort of, that's almost like you seeing a celebrity. Mm-hmm, a dead one, but. <laughs> <laughs> But it's very, um, it, it hits you mm -hmm. in a special way. And when I did that thing on uh, Nicholas Henderson, my uh, wife's great-great-grandfather, mm -hmm. 
how the kids associated the U.S. Army. He's, he's right there. I showed the picture of the grave. He's right there, picture of me standing next to it. And look at what's around him, the U.S. Army. Right. And so, uh, so these things are the way you try to get feelings across the kids that history is important. And it's still alive. Yes. Okay. That's, that's and, pretty and, and fantastic. <laughs> One day... I got, uh, the principal stopped me over in Jacksonville School, stopped me right in the hallway, and he kind of put his arm around me a little bit. He said, Larry, I hear you're out of the building a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, <duh. laughs> I said, well, yeah. Back in those days, you could leave and then come back without gotcha. uh, having all this other stuff with you. And uh, I said, yeah, Rich. And he said, are you teaching the curriculum? <laughs> I said, Rich. Jacksonville is the curriculum. It's uh, the whole 300 years of U.S. history, Jacksonville, 100 years of history. Mm. I said, everything that went out there happened right here. So I'm teaching this to show the bigger picture. He says, well, good. As long as you're teaching the <laughs> curriculum, that's okay. And he walked back to his office. <laughs> Gallivanting <laughs> in the town of Jacksonville. with. Yeah, I had another lady stop me, a former retired teacher who was, said, I see you out around a lot. <laughs> she said, shouldn't they be back in their room learning their multiplication tables? I said, Clara, this is PE. Nice. I'm teaching PE. <laughs> nice. I like it. I like it. So, and I also get this sense that you, when it comes to history especially, you, you can't get enough. You just like, oh, mm. give me more and more and more. That's, wh that's why I've been to so many national parks. <laughs> yeah. How did you... How did you turn into Jacksonville's town historian? You know everything about Jacksonville. Well, first off, I started teaching about it. Okay. And then when I went there in 1966, there were old timers in town, like Robbie Collins. Oh, and, and they so just on. stories. Yeah, and, stories. and you could talk to them personally, and they mm -hmm. would tell me what stood here, or what was over here, or something like that. Awesome. S and uh, Fred Kaufman, who grew up in Jacksonville, he was uh, a miner's son. He died several years ago, but he lived to be 95 years old. And I took him up into the gold mines, and he shared these stories with me of what it was like when he was there at 12. And so when you go up there and see that water cannon, that's yeah. all from Fred Kaufman. He described what was down in that canyon. And then I had an artist draw that picture up. Mm -hmm. And then when the Boy Scouts came in there, they used that picture to recreate that scene down there that Fred saw when he was 12 years old. That he told me when he was 90 years old to me. That's fantastic. So that's, that's the kind of connection we had. So talking to the old timers got me started on this and then having kids watching the lights come on in a kid's eyes mm -hmm. and the first day of school the first hour that they're sitting in my classroom i always started out with kids my job is to open up the world to you and that's what we're going to be doing this year i'm going to be opening up the world and i still do that with my subbing i try to i only have them for six hours but i try to open up the world as much as i can during that six hours you sound like you are because you're still substitute teaching but an absolute amazing teacher. Well, they tell me that. Because <laughs> you love it. Yeah. You love it. Well, I, and I t told the kids uh, Monday, I said, here I am teaching a lesson, but you know what I'm doing? I'm, I'm teaching the lesson. It was math. It was kind of rote. I said, but I'm looking at each one of your eyes as I go around. I said, and I'm focusing in on each one of you. Are you connecting with me? Do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. What are you doing behind those eyes? <laughs> and, and I told them that on Monday that, Teaching is just only part of it. Part of it is making sure I'm getting the message out to you. Fantastic. If I was in your class, my eyeballs would be either daydreaming or chatting. I was a chatterbox, <laughs> especially during math class, <laughs> snooze fest. Um, so a couple of things that you have taught me um, just since I've been interviewing you about Jacksonville, the town burned down three times. Mm -hmm. Portions of it. Portions yes. burned down yeah. three times. And you said... Then they finally said, let's, let's do brick. Mm -hmm. Let's do brick instead of wood. And it's interesting, the only wooden f uh, building in town uh, on Main Street, mm -hmm. or actually California Street, is the Beekman Bank. Right. And it's wood. But somehow it got saved in all three of those major fires. Interesting. Interesting. And, and there were other fires also around. And, and the interesting thing about the fires is that uh, they just invented insurance. And Beekman was selling insurance, and it wasn't against the law. If your, build, if your business was not doing real well, just burn it down and get the insurance money out of it. Exactly. <laughs> and so they had to change that real, real, real fast. I bet. Um, I'm going to sort of start wrapping up. But before I do, uh, I, I want to have you back, and let's talk about the things that we didn't talk about, like the Park Service and Crater Lake and okay. all the things you did up there. So I'll bug you 
because I know you're semi-retired, so you have time for me. I know that. <laughs> um, and really quickly, before we get to the final three, let's talk about the Brit Gardens, because I absolutely love this story. It was this huge patch of land that really the community saved. Mm -hmm. You guys saved it and wanted to preserve it and make it special and your own. So how did that start? Well, it started with a for sale sign showing up on the Beekman property, mm -hmm. which is right behind the Beekman house. And that hit, the family had left it to, to the University of Oregon. Okay. And they put it up for sale in 1989. And so the Woodlands Association was formed. We purchased that 23 acres up there. And then we're, we're just going to go out of business. Right. Because we'd saved. So you're like, we're good. 20, 23 acres. 23 acres. That's pretty good. Uh, yes. Right in the heart of town. Right. And just right then, <coughs> the uh, Southern Oregon, who had inherited the Brit property, decided to put up the Brit property for sale. Right. And so we, re we got a new president. We reinvigorated ourselves, added to the board, and then raised the money for that. And it's a long detail story, but that's kind of in a nutshell. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And, they, uh, and so that was uh, over 80 acres that we picked up there. And by then, the county had already bought the home site. That was for the festival grounds. They had bought 10 acres from the university. Got, that's the Brit grounds. Yeah. Okay. That and the Brit Park, which is down below. Right. And since then, the city has, sl uh, well, actually the county sliced off the upper five acres. They still own that. And mm -hmm. the lower five acres is owned by uh, the city of Jacksonville. But so really, the people <coughs> said, this is ours. Yeah. You know, the Woodlands Association has raised four and a half million dollars. Wow. In the last 30 years. Wow. To save all this land. That's huge. And the, the land, I assume, is worth about 15 million now. Fantastic. If you put it on the open market. Well, nice work. And you were an integral part of that. Well, I... You helped. I wrote a lot of letters. A lot of letters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a letter writer. <laughs> it's like, I know my role. I know what I'm good at. That's what I will yeah. do. All right, Larry Smith, we're going to uh, wrap it up here, get to the final three. Best advice you've ever been given? I've been contemplating that, and I have to go at least with a couple. Okay. When I decided to become a teacher, I walked into Dr. Marshall Waddell's office there in Churchill Hall, and I said, I want to become a history teacher. Mm. And six words changed my life. I can't wait. He said, why? They're a dime a dozen. Wow. And I walked out of there absolutely crushed. Oh, man. I mean, he, there were no jobs is what he's saying. Yeah. Because every coach wanted to become a history teacher because it was easy to teach. But they didn't have a passion for it. So I went across the hall and signed up to be an elementary teacher with Dr. Hollenbeck. <laughs> or Mother Holly, as we called mm -hmm. her. And Ron Lamb. And uh, got into that program as an elementary ed teacher. And it, was, uh, it changed my life. So those six words changed my life there. How, how so? Because you were because crushed. Instead of, because of being a history, high school history teacher, I became an elementary teacher teaching history. And that's better? Oh, infinitely better. Okay. Well, good. I'm so glad I didn't get into the high school one because it had just been six classes, you know, of just history. And who was that professor again? That was Dr. Marshall Waddell. Well, thank you, Dr. Waddell. <laughs> he changed your life. Yes. And okay. that was 50 years ago. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Hard to believe. And then... <clears throat> the other advice was unspoken advice. My father. Okay. I watched my father, the way he treated my mother, so warmly, lovingly, and I learned how to treat other people through my father, through by his example. He never really gave advice. He just lived a life that we wanted to emulate. Wow. And he lived to be 90. 90, 97. 97, yeah. That gives me goosebumps, Larry. I love that. It's the it's the whole um, <coughs> do as I do kind of, mm -hmm. you know, watch what I do and, and he was, walk the walk. He was always consistent in his life. Hmm. Never, he never came out of character, you could say. Fantastic. I love that. So if you ever left this place, you've been here for a very long time, what would you miss <coughs> the most? What's your happy place here? Well, the happy place is the Rogue Valley. Mm -hmm. um, I've watched it change dramatically from a, a, a mining, uh, orchardist, uh, farming community to Walmarts, 
and <laughs> all is, the, the is big. Is that a good thing? Well, the orchards are gone, mm -hmm. and the orchards provided food, and now nobody. It's cheaper to bring food in from Peru than just to grow it in your own backyard, which I still can't understand that. Same. And I've, we've got a farm. Our family farm is sitting over there. We've got six, ac six acres left, uh, 13. Dad sold off a little bit here and there. It's just sitting fallow because nobody wants it. My neighbor next door had about a 15-acre truck farm he did for years. And uh, now they're growing marijuana on it. That's not food. Um, and I drive between Phoenix and Medford, and I look at those thousands of acres of orchards that used to be out there, and nothing but weeds and blackberries growing on it. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do for food? The new Costco, wonderful as it is, that's a sitting on the most f best, finest farmland in the world. It's all paved over. So, and that's Bear, see, Bear Creek was right there, and that's where all the deep mm -hmm. loam soil was. So the biggest thing I'm finding happening here in the valley is we're losing all of our farmland. Even though Oregon has its rules, uh, we're, you can't help it. So pay, you miss that. But I'm getting, what I'm getting at is you drive into Jacksonville, and I have a sense of my history there. Mm. My great uncle and great aunt, Lena and Ras Rasmussen, showed up there in 1945, and then that, that other hundred and so relatives and there's still a lot of relatives living in that area. For the first 20 years of my teaching, I had a relative or two every year in my room. <laughs> there were second cousins, third cousins. The last year I taught, I had a fifth cousin in my room. Oh, so funny. And so, uh, so I still have a sense of familiarity when I go back to Jacksonville. And those are my roots, even though I grew up in Phoenix. Takes you back a little bit. It does, yeah. Awesome. Okay, this next question you actually emailed me about, which I thought was pretty funny. If you were given a last meal and a last drink, I know don't think of it as the morbid, yeah. but just your last day to celebrate and you're given whatever you want to eat and drink, what would that look like? Be a thick slab of salmon. Okay, yes. Done very well. And a glass of hot milk. Hot milk? Milk. Yes. <laughs> really? <laughs> Where does that come uh, from? From well, we grew up on a farm. Yeah. And we had milk running out of our ears. <laughs> and uh, I grew up on milk, and I, I go through a gallon to two gallons every week. Okay. Of milk, and every morning I have to start out with my glass of hot milk. Hot milk. And then after dinner, a glass of hot milk, and uh, and so I don't drink coffee. I just have never liked it. I don't drink tea. I I dislike the stuff immensely. I've never had any alcohol because I watched the people around us growing up that mm -hmm. were in alcohol and it was killing them and I didn't want anything. So as a six-year-old, I just said, I'm not going to ever drink alcohol. It's, <laughs> it's destroying people. You know, you, when you drove to, in the early days, you drive down Front Street. Yeah. A, and that's where the railroad was. Uh-huh. And the drunks were all out. <laughs> we call them homeless now, but uh, <laughs> the drunks are out there. And, and, and they're, they're, they're spilling their beer on everything. Well, they asked you whiskey and cheap wine. And they were known as winos. And a six-year-old, I said, I don't want any of this stuff. So bring on the hot milk. Yeah, right, bring on the hot milk. Um, what kind of milk? Are we talking whole, 2%, skim? Oh, when, when we were raised, we were drinking the rich stuff because it had come mm. from a Jersey cow, 50% mm -hmm. butterfat. Yum. And dad lived to be almost 98. So that's what you drink. And But no, I've gone to, <laughs> I've gone to skim milk. Okay, okay. <laughs> the All doctor right. says skim milk is the best. But he had my cholesterol checked uh, a few months ago. He couldn't believe my cholesterol was so low, drinking milk. Right. Do you ever, once in a while, though, drink a glass of whole milk, and you're just like, oh, man. Uh, I feel like I'm putting chapstick on. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, I, I do that once in a while. Like, mm, this, this is the stuff I used yeah. to like. Now I, I don't like it as well as it's... I do my, my skim milk. Okay, salmon and hot milk. Larry, that's the best answer I think I've ever heard. I like it. If you are listening to this podcast on iTunes and you like it, please subscribe, rate, and review. It helps other people find us. We are also on Google Play. And you can check out the video portion of this podcast at ktvl.com. Just click on Features and then Off Script. I say this to a few of my podcast guests, but I really do want to have you back. You were fun, Larry Thank Smith. You. Very fun. Thank you. Go to Jacksonville. If you see Larry walking around, say hi to him and demand he tell you a history lesson of Jacksonville. Larry Smith, once again, thank you so much.